co-chairs and the local organizers and hosts of this conference, I'd like to welcome everyone to the 2017 conference here in Northern Arizona in Flagstaff. Um, first off, I'd like to thank our local hosts, uh, the Collentines, Joe and Karina Collentines. Where are you guys seated? part of a wonderful team who have helped set up this conference. Um, and as usual, we'd like to thank Esther Horn and the volunteers for organizing the details of the conference. <laughs> I'd also like to extend a personal thank you to both Ana Oscas and Marta gonzalez Yoret, our conference chairs who have also done a lot of work in coordinating things. And with that, I'm going to hand things over to Anna, who will begin by welcoming you and giving you information about the conference. I would like to call your attention to some events that are useful at this conference, but also to some events that are new this year. Um, what we really want to do at this Calico conference is to really get to know each other more, to get to new, to get to know new people. So in all the social events, make sure that you talk to three people that you don't know, because that's the point. We always get together and we want to know and expand our horizons. So we want to uh, welcome the new members and the graduate students, and we want to get new ideas for future presentations at Calico. Um, we are going to have a few social business events. Uh, today, after the keynote speaker, we are going to have the reception and we are going to have some music from the area. You will get to know Aaron White with the, music, with the guitar and the flute. Uh, tomorrow, in addition to the presentations, we are going to have three business uh, social events. First of all, make sure that all of you come at 4.45 to the business meeting where our current president, Shannon Soro, uh, will provide us with updates of the organization of Calico. Um, there will be another second reception of the conference at 6.30 at the technology showcase and poster session. And there will be a third event, another event at the reception of the conference. As you see, we are very social here. <laughs> Uh, which, is a calico, which is a combination of the Calico's Reviewer Appreciation and the Graduate Student SIG at the Macmillan Bar and Kitchen on Route 66. That will start at 7.30, from 7.30 to 9.30. So as you can see, we have plenty of opportunities to get to know each other and to meet new people. But that's not it. There is more. <laughs> so in addition to all the presentations, you have all these things to do. On Friday, we have the dinner buffet, which is included in the registration. Afterwards, make sure that you head out to the 1899 ballroom for a night of dancing. We hope that you sent your dancing request to Esther. If you haven't done that yet, don't worry, you're still on time. Make sure that you send your favorite song. And without further ado, I'm, going, I'm giving the floor to Marta gonzalez Lloret, who will, who will present our keynote speaker. Hello, everybody. It is such an honor to introduce today Professor Lourdes Ortega. For a few years now, we have been invited keynote speakers that are outside of the field of call, because we want to open our ideas and we want to bring uh, other ideas into our field. Today we have the fortune of having someone that has worked in and out of the field of call. Anybody and everybody in SLA 
knows and has read Professor Lourdes Ortega's um, look forward looking work on cognitive SLA, meta analysis, multilingualism, and uses based and critical approaches to SLA. But many of us also know her whole work. She working for early in her career in 1997. She wrote an article in LLT on network classrooms, and she still today is an excellent ambassador of call in mainstream SLA venues. She gave a plenary talk at the third international task-based language teaching conference on task and technology in language learning. She co-edited a volume on technology-mediated tasks for John Benjamins in 2014. And there were numerous articles that included technology that were published in the language learning journal while she was the journal editor between the uh, 2010 and 2015. Today, she is an advocate and a conscious user of technology. And although it took a little bit to convince her of the benefits of mobile technology, she's now a very enthusiastic user, as can be confirmed by her Facebook friends. <laughs> her publications are far too many to cite here. She has published nine edited volumes, more than 25 articles in journals, more than 40 chapters in edited volumes and encyclopedias, and her 2009 book, Understanding Second Language Acquisition, is number 116 on the top selling books in linguistics in Amazon. Oh. <laughs> Professor Ortega has been a keynote speaker all over the world, and I, and I really mean all over the world. She has given a plenary scene Greece, Belgium, Germany, Japan, Australia, Canada, England, New Zealand, Spain, Switzerland, Finland, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Canada, and of course, all over the United States. But it was not difficult to convince her to come to this conference because NAU and the faculty here have a special place in her heart. Lourdes has received uh, several awards recognizing her work, including a uh, Mellow Fellowship, the Binsler Award for Research in Foreign Language Education, and the TESOL Distinguished Research Award. But I know that what she's most proud of are her students and her mentoring work, which I was a very lucky recipient. And her mentoring was recognized last year with the competitive Georgetown University Gerald Mara Faculty Award. It is our privilege and pleasure to welcome Professor Lourdes Ortega. This is what we do in Hawaii. <laughs> okay, this is difficult. It's difficult to speak when you're very, very moved. And uh, Marta has touched several spots that make me very, very moved right now. Um, thank you so much, Marta. I wanted to thank the organizers of the conference, uh, the people behind all the many months of organizing the conference and especially to Marta and to Anna for inviting me to be here, because it really is a very special um, thing to be here, back in Pakistan and in AU. After 13 years, I left 13 years ago, and I hadn't come back, so it's amazing to be here. And um, yes, I liked all the things that Marta said in the introduction, but she kind of killed a few of the things that I was going to say. <laughs> and one of the things that I was going to say is that I am a low-tech dilettante of technology and SLA. Um, so um, now, here and there, now and then, um, people ask me to talk about technology in relationship to SLA, and I'm really happy to do it, because I do think that like technology is very important in our world, and in pedagogy, and in acquiring languages. Um, but most of my work, except for the 1997 article, which was actually my first publication in the field, I think, um, all of my work when it's, it's been about technology has always been with Magna. So I'm learning a lot from her. And no, the glasses don't help. <laughs> it's always the problem with the PowerPoint. All right. So. Before I continue, just to say that I'm happy to share the PowerPoint with anyone. Um, all I need to do is add the references at the end that I haven't done yet, but I'm very happy to um, send and share the PowerPoint as is and with the references to anyone. 
Um, so I want to talk about interfaces between call and SLA, and there have been a long tradition of interrogating each other in the two fields. Um, these publications, you know them even better than me, and many of the people are sitting in the room. Um, it seems that there is a lot of um, pondering about whether the theoretical grounding for call should be uh, found in SLA theories, there is also a little bit of discomfort that might, that, might, uh, that may be too much theoretical borrowing. Um, so a lot of the um, search lately may have been more towards can we find native theories for the call. And in general, I see a little bit of a tension between disciplinary autonomy and disciplinary cross-pollination between call and SLA. What I want to talk to, um, to you about today it has to do with interfaces between the two fields, but it, hasn't, it doesn't have much to do with the types of interfaces that have been explored before. I want to continue interrogating each other, but I want to broaden the, the search and look for expanded uh, interfaces. So I want to talk about multilingualism, which is really my favorite topic since 2010, probably. And I want to talk about social justice. And I had to pay to show you this cartoon. <laughs> but I just thought it was too precious not to show it. So my plan is to um, uh, talk about what uh, multilingualism and social justice have to do with each other and with call and SLA first. Then um, to tell you a little bit about the greatly changed landscape of SLA in the 21st century. And then I'll go into the the heart of the presentation, which is looking for expanded interfaces, um, taking multilingualism and social justice as the guiding um, shared uh, goals. And I also work within the assumption that the cornerstones of a scientific paradigm are ontology, epistemology, methodology, and this is what uh, Schulze and Smith uh, said recently in an editorial introduction, Calico. Um, but also axiology, which I always want to add to these three perspectives. So, what and who is our research good for? Okay, so let me start with multilingualism and social justice and try to explain the connections that I see between the two and with the two fields of call and SLA. Uh, one of the reasons why they are related is because most of the world is multilingual, right? So, we all have a mother tongue or mother tongues that we acquire through primary socialization in the family. And then we all have a language or languages of formal schooling. Um, those are typically the languages also of the nation state where we live. And because of globalization, if we don't have English in those two contexts, then we add it almost without really having any choice anymore. And then life brings us a number of other languages to many of us. So, if you look around and if you ask uh, well enough, uh, you will find out that many, many people are now multilingual across all kinds of contexts in the world. But, it's an equitable multilingualism. Because there is this question of whether the language or languages in the family and in school and perhaps even in globalization, are the same or not. So, when there is continuity between the language of the home and the language of schooling, and if there are sufficient resources to access education, technology, and English, we have elite multilinguals. They live their, biling their bilingualism or multilingualism harmoniously, not as a burden in life. But if we have a discontinuity, in the languages between the home and the school, or perhaps between the home and the school and then the language of globalization, and if there is uncertainty in terms of the wealth that families and communities have to access education, English, and technology, then we end up having multilinguals who are marginalized. And so researching multilingualism, in order to support it, obviously, is our business in SLA and in call. And it's also our responsibility and our mission. And so clearly part of our research is to produce knowledge about all the grids and shades and shapes of multilingualism 
and to serve all ultimate wealth, not just those with privilege. At the same time, when we're talking about coal, obviously, we cannot avoid the issue of the digital divide. And here's a very nice depiction of it, um, drawn from an interview reported in, a, in, a, in an article by Virginia Eubanks, a feminist. So this is kind of like a depiction of the, of the digital divide. And what uh, Ruth the Gadelbutzman said in her interview with uh, Eubanks was, we don't need to look at the whole. <coughs> We need to look at the net. We need to work at solving the net for everyone, instead of just looking always at the whole in depression. And I'm very, very pleased to see serendipitously that uh, there is a special issue called in Calico Journal um, for um, a collection on social inclusivity and social uh, justice. So let me move on to the changed landscape of SLA. Everyone knows mainstream SLA, the cognitive interactions theories, and especially the work on interaction specifically has been very uh, well received by core researchers and very well tested in online environments. But we got the social turn in SLA in the early 90s, starting in the early 90s. And we got a bifurcation of SLA research that looked more cognitively at acquisition of knowledge as skills. That was the mainstream at the time and other researchers who were looking more socioculturally at how learning a language means learning to participate in communities and learning to process language. Language is a process, not an object. So out of those critiques, we really had a turbulent time in SLA for a little while, uh, but a bit of acrimony perhaps in publications and in, in dialogues and exchanges. But really, we just got the social turn done and completed by now. So things like context, sociocultural agency, discourse, variability of language, self in the world, power, they have been by now well um, discussed and accepted, I think, by many in SLA. So what we have in the late SLA of the late 90s is a, a, a picture where we have some researchers looking at cognitive and mental phenomena, language learning, others looking at sociocultural and contextual phenomena, and many also looking at instructed and teaching types of issues. And I think that that really, that landscape is what, what has generated the most interfaces to date between SLA and COL. But the upshot of the social turn was that there was a boom, a booming of epistemological diversification in the field. And so what we have now is not one, but many cognitive theories and not one, but many, quite, quite a few, theories that are socioculturally and socially oriented. And so we have very rich differences in emphasis, method, and grain size among those socially oriented theories of SLA, but they really are all socially oriented and minded. And so last year, in 2016, um, a group of 15 of us socially minded uh, SLA researchers uh, wrote a, an article that got published in One Language Journal, and because we were 15, we decided to give it uh, an author name um, that wouldn't be like a long list of 15 names. So the Douglas Fair group, and Douglas Fair is just the room where we had our last meeting before starting to draft the paper in Portland, actually. And so it's it's the gathering of socially oriented SLA allied perspectives because we all felt that there was potential for synergy, integrativeness, and complementarity among ourselves. And here's a photo that someone in the audience took at that time. Um, I guess, yeah, from there. And Patsy Duff, Elaine Teron, Eduardo Negueruela, John Kelly Hall, John Schumann, Dwight Atkinson, this is Jim Lantoff, almost hidden behind the podium, Diane Larson Freeman, Bonnie Norton, and Nick Ellis, Heidi Burns, and then Meryl Swain, Meredith Doran, and, and Karen Johnson were also part of the, of, the, of the 15, but they weren't in that particular event at AAA in 2015. So what we agreed upon in this article is that language learning can be defined as learning to negotiate social and linguistic action in the face of minimal common ground 
and maximal semiotic demands. Notice the social and linguistic action, because we wanted to stress that language is a practice rather than just a system. Notice the minimal common ground, emphasizing that language and communication are unpredictable. And notice the semiotic demands to really get to the point that language is more than just language. Language is always enmeshed with all kinds of other resources, multimodal, non-linguistic resources that make meaning. Okay, but we still need to have a bilingual or multilingual term where we think of learning languages as the norm and not as a sort of like romanticized feat or a, a curse of parts of society. Um, a bilingual term where we could think of learners in a non-deficit light. Um, there was a lot of interest in looking at cross-linguistic interactions among the languages of the multilinguals in all directions. Um, a lot of interest in language relativity and language and thought, and also some interest in ideologies of language. So a lot of exploration of ontology. What is it really that language learning is and that language is? But it's been a very slow uh, progress with this. It started really in the very early 90s with the work of William Cook, who's an excellent researcher. And yet, it's been very, very slow. Finally, last year, 2016, we got uh, Handbook of multi linguistic multi competence, co edited by Vivian Cook and Liu Wei, and have a chapter in it. And uh, it's really very nice to see that the bilingual term perhaps is really now finally going to happen. But let me explain to you a little bit what translanguaging or translingual practices are, because they will be important for the rest of the paper. So, it's what routinely goes into making meaning, uh, uh, because meaning and making meaning is more than just language. So an example from Li Wei um, this past February in Athens. What does that mean? We all understand it. And here? So there's no language in it, perhaps the I in both cases, perhaps. There's a heart. But the heart is an image and if transliterated it's a noun but not a verb but we're making it into a verb. And the second image, the object is inside the heart in the form of a flag that we need to culturally recognize or else we wouldn't know what it means. Right? So that's trans language. We make meaning but by packing together whatever resources we can to make meaning, whatever bits of semiotic repertoire, and it's always multisensory and multimodal. This is normal language all the time. And the languages of rural Tilingua are interconnected, identifiable, yes, but inseparable. So, multilinguals or bilinguals never, never use one language only, and they never use one language at a time. I'm using English overtly only, but I'm a bilingual, multilingual. I am doing all these other things. My brain is just not monolingually now producing this monolingual output. Because covertly and overtly, all languages and all the semiotic resources are activated when bilinguals language. And we know this from psycholinguistic and cognitive science research. It's completely well established now. So bilinguals always translanguage. And the proposal then is that let's purposefully use translanguage in pedagogy. We still need one more turn in SLA, and this I don't think has really happened yet. There are some discussions about IRB ethics or the relevance for teachers of SLA research, some discussion about why we don't investigate vulnerable populations more often, or that our research, just like any other research, is very value-laden. But in general, the examination of values, the axiology um, enterprise has not really sunk in yet with SLA entirely. But why do we need a social turn now, a social justice turn now? First, because we have multilingualism that is inequitable. And we need to serve all kinds of multilinguals, not just a portion of them. And to understand all kinds of multilingualism, not just a tiny type of multilingualism. Second, because we have the digital divide and we want to have 
technology for all, not for a few at the service of language. And also because we have a world that is really giving us a hard challenge right now. UNESCO has goals for 2030 to end poverty, to promote peace, to share wealth, and to protect the planet. And on the other hand, in the world, anti-migration, uh, Islamophobia, anti-diversity, and the widening of poverty gaps is rampant. So, our professional responsibility perhaps is to respond with research to these challenges. Are we going to do it or not? That's the question. I took this photo in the march um, over Washington, um, right after um, the change of government. And I didn't take this photo thinking of this event, but uh, it's an interesting twist to think about uses of technology um, and their consequences. Okay, so in sum, we have the late 90s giving us a kind of interface to work together, but we can move on now to look for better things to do together because we have had a social turn, we are having a multilingual turn, and hopefully very soon we'll have a social justice turn. So, let me talk about the multilingual turn for call is a day. Is there a monolingual bias in call? What's your sense? I tried to, to do my homework. I didn't want to just go on an intuition. There are many encouraging glimpses of a multilingual turn in call. For example, Dooley says that the notion that learners are principal, principally monolingual speakers learning other languages as separate systems is flawed. And Schulze and Smith say aligning individual call researchers with current discourses in applied linguistics requires us to conceptualize and depict the language learner as a multilingual subject who has agency, performs complex activities in a variety of social contexts, and has a unique personal identity. Soro explains that in fan fiction, multilingual identities and multilingual practices have been studied extensively, and she cites fan subbing and scanlation as two uh, examples. Uh, Helm, in her survey of telecollaborations in Europe, found that 56% of them are bilingual tandem, involving two languages, not one, and that 20% of those exchanges are between lingua franca uh, users, so English is a lingua franca users in all cases. And finally, Tudini says that online language learning partnerships with multilingual intercultural speakers of the target language rather than monolingual L1 speakers should be given a more prominent role in language programs because she found evidence in her study that they access, by accessing the shared languages, they achieve reciprocity, understanding, affiliation, and learning. This is all great. We also have a presentation tomorrow morning by Linda Bradley, directly relevant, and we have um, Steve um, Thorne and Judy Sykes and Stephanie Knight also presenting on social justice issues. But still, many call studies today continue to operate under monolingual assumptions that participants speak only one language and learn only one second language. So they speak one first language only and they learn one second language only. But there is one target language which is homogeneous, standard, and educated. And in the best cases, when there are conventions and digital registers to teach or learn, those are seen as bounded, as an object, as a thing that can be described and given to learners. Learning means becoming more native-like in many studies, and the best source to learn a language in many studies is thought to be native speakers. But there is also good news. Call is ideally positioned to contribute to SLA research into multilingual repertoires as we imagine them in the, the Douglas Fir um, group paper. Because the openness of language resources is augmented in digital communication, as critical social linguists of digital communication have found. So, in digital communication, translanguaging is at, at its best. We can study it and we can find it everywhere. Um, 
people communicate online, digitally, with whatever bits of semiotic repertoires they have, always multisensorily and multimodally, and never using one language only or one language at a time. They code mix, they mix tremendously. So let me show a few examples. I think I'm going to flash through them fast. In spoken interactions, many speakers suffer linguistic insecurity. Because they have imperfect proficiency, they're perhaps foreign language learners, or because they have internalized stigmatization, they're hate speakers, they're dialect speakers. It seems that in, on in online spaces, many of the same speakers, perhaps most speakers, uh, show much greater tolerance towards language variation. And so in CMC, for example, it's rare to find things that we find much more often in face-to-face -face communication, like comments about uh, creating a new orthography uh, that is not really standard, or recommending people for, you, for choosing a language, changing languages, or mixing languages. So linguistic diversity thrives in digital worlds. And multilingualism also thrives in digital worlds. I'm going to skip this, even though it's a beautiful study, a very impressive analysis of how people choose languages to whom within a Facebook um, exchange over four weeks. In sum, we have a lot of evidence that linguistic diversity thrives in digital worlds and that multilingualism thrives in digital worlds. And researchers who study this phenomena describe them as Online spaces, in online spaces we see translation, intersentential, intersentential code switching and borrowing, an impressive range of multilingual practices. Or, uh, Carmen Lee says, interacting or doing things with more than one language becomes an important resource for all web users. Funnily enough, interestingly, intriguingly enough, including those who are considered monolinguals in the offline world, in a super diverse world. So, we still have questions, because we don't know if this openness of language resources in the digital wilds, the creative orthography, the, the code choices, the code switching, the identity performance, the ideology, ideology negotiations surrounding language diversity, we don't know how well our students learn it merely by digital communication in the wild, and we do not know whether we should teach it in the classroom. But it's a very interesting set of evidence towards the promise of digital communication for leveraging a new view of language learning that includes translanguaging and um, semiotic resources of all kinds. So, let me give some examples and some research questions. Blythe and Dalola have a study where their main research question was how can we support translingual, uh, the translingual paradigm in foreign language education? So they're very famously authors of the uh, France, France Interactive, I'm speaking French. Um, so in 2004, they created the textbooks and the videos, and they purposefully included native speakers of French, either US um, students in French who had been abroad, or French people living in the US for a long time. And they left all the uses of the first language code, code mixing and grammatical just completely unedited in the videos, on purpose. But in the end, in 2011, they realized they hadn't achieved their goals. The teachers and the students noticed a little bit of that going on, but they weren't using it for any particular purpose or for learning. And so they decided that they needed to supplement the textbook and video with um, a Facebook page with a moderator who would sort of like instigate this translanguaging and this appreciation for the openness language resources. And then lots of things happened. One example that they show is when the moderator posted an article that was uh, switching back and forth between uh, English and French, and it elicited all kinds of positive reactions, lots of reactions in the Facebook page, but also very positive reactions uh, mixing language, so the, the contributors who are learners of French, they were mixing languages in their postings, and they were recognizing the openness of language in their own experience. And they were also celebrating multilingualism. And they were playfully celebrating multilingualism, exchanging jokes uh, and code switching and mixing languages. 
I'm not reading it because my eyes absolutely don't see it in my screen. <laughs> see it. So there are also two promising environments to instigate uh, translanguaging and to study multilingual texts, practices, ideologies, and identities. Those are e-tandem and lingua franca exchanges, to collaboration exchanges. Um, so we can ask questions like, what happens when languages are shared as in tandem, or when linguistic expertise um, in the novice and, and expert roles of the native and native speaker are interchangeable, interchangeable in both tandem and uh, L2 speaker, L2 speaker exchanges. Does reciprocity do something for linguistic confidence, for openness of language, for translanguaging, and for language learning? Tutini has done a little bit of that work, but it's all unexplored. And I'm going to sum up and say we have the opportunity to focus more explicitly on multilingualism in call, and that way we could open up new questions specific to call and the digital environments, but relevant to SLA as a whole. For example, can digital communication instigate language learning of an open, flexible kind? a sort of multilingual learning that tolerates language variation, celebrates translanguaging, and relaxes or even counters negative language ideologies. Or, how can we do this with technologies once we domesticate them for classroom-related purposes, or for other uh, non-classroom technologies that are dedicated exclusively to language learning? And a recent study by Lynn Warshauer and Blake looked into live mocha and the kinds of uses and attitudes that it uses um, from uh, learners. So this is a fully dedicated uh, uh, application of technology to language. There are cautionary tales as well. The monolingual deficit. Ideologies circulate in all spaces, certainly, and digital and net spaces too. <coughs> so Thorne, Soro, and Smith um, remark that call studies have captured cases of covert bilingualism practiced by multilingual fans who pretend that they're not, they hide that they're not um, native speakers of English just to not be pigeonholed or treated as efficient in the English fandom communities. So how are monolingual deficit ideologies enacted and resisted in digital space? That would be also a very good question to ask. And even in the software design of digital spaces, how are different ideologies of language enacted and resisted? For example, Bungeon's Koston uh, has a very short but interesting study looking at native speakerness and language learnerness and how they're put into the design of the software <coughs> and they force certain actions and participation frames. For, for example, one eight doesn't have the like icon of Facebook, instead it has a native nod uh, that native speakers are allowed to give when they are approving of the versions that the non-native speakers submit for correction. So the overarching dual focus should be, in my opinion, learning to embrace and exploit the openness of language resources in language learning and doing multiple work. And Chan Smith and Kern have talked about how we need to pay attention to forms, but also to context, meanings, and ideologies. And Thorne, Soro, and Smith have also drawn attention to the fact that the research methods to do this kind of thing should be multiple and should look at discourse, social action, phenomenological experiences of the learners, and be definitely interpretive and multiple in So we're looking at interfaces between SLA and call that look at multilingual texts, multilingual practices, and multilingual identities and ideologies. Social justice, am I cutting it short? No, good. I don't want to cut social justice short. <laughs> so, the first thing is we need to know well, very, very well, our facts about the digital divide. And my impression is that if it's <coughs> whole literature, it may get mentioned, cited, but it's never explored seriously and in depth. That's my impression. I may be wrong. So, here's again the cartoon that I had to pay to show you by a Belgian cartoonist who apparently is very well known. 
So it's the haves and, not, and have nots of technology, right? But it's not really that simple. So in the UK, healthcare describes the process by which public services are becoming digital by default, the so-called e-government. And then this is creating a digital underclass who are unable to have sustained digital access, and so they cannot access these services either. So that's deepening the digital divide. So without technology, then have not so technology are even worse off than they ever were before. And in fact, unequal access to internet computing is unequal access to health, education, workforce, civic participation, and personal well-being. And these inequalities manifest themselves in access, use, and know-how to use. So really, what we have is a very different kind of picture. <laughs> the disenfranchised in society in terms of just poverty, they need food, yes, but they need technology too. It's not a luxury. It's a vital necessity for them. It excludes them from participation and from well-being when they don't have access to technology. So, better yet, if we can say multilingually, then better. <laughs> we can translanguage a little bit. So, a little bit of Spanish, a little English, a little bit of German. So, in a nutshell, what do we know about the digital divide? There's so much research. I read and read and read and I was fascinated preparing for this talk. It depends continually, worldwide and domestically, in the United States. It's about access, the so-called first order digital divide, but also about use, and this is the second order digital divide. And use depends on speed, because bandwidth follows income, and we all want lots of bandwidth. Consistency of use, so, Interruptions of service for people who don't have enough money to pay for the service at home or to pay for the repair or the antivirus to keep their computers updated or to even buy a computer, of course. Uh, the precarity and surveillance problem, I didn't know about this at all, but in autocratic re regimes, in conflict zones, in surveilled borders, in refugee camps, technology can be a real problem in the sense that if you have technology, you're vulnerable to surveillance or you're vulnerable to precarity of information because they feed you different kinds of information from what you want. And the quality of differentiated use, so high quality use of technology, which has shown very robust Matthew effects. The wealthy get wealthier. So if they're better, very better off in society, they will get even better off through the use of high quality functional technology. And of course, the digital literacies, the, having the know-how um, of using technology. It's all relative though, because you see statistics like in 2015, more than 3 billion people had access to the internet worldwide. And you're like, yes, this is good good picture. But then you get things like, well, that's slightly less than half the population of the world. And then you think, well, that's not right. This is not enough for us. So I think it's really a matter of empathy whether we take it optimist optimistically or pessimistically. So again, another cartoon for which I didn't pay, I have to confess. <laughs> One fish says, whoa, half empty, definitely half empty. But the other fish says, just listen to you, always the pessimist. <laughs> but they are in very different places in the class or in life. So this empathy, this capacity for empathy is shaped by experience and by research in researchers like us. Because we're privileged, we are academics, we are middle class, we're educated, we're progressive, we encounter disenfranchisement very rarely close up and personal, very rarely. And if we, on top of that, choose to research in a way that precludes us from having any kind of contact with disenfranchised populations, 
then we really just, again, don't have the first-hand experience of how um, social justice or injustice plays out. So we can develop a sort of like low empathy level. It's kind of an exaggeration, the digital divide, you know, the arguments on how you look at it, making a lot of progress. But think of the two fish. I think it's fair to say researchers are always the fish with the head happily in the water. So, the significance of capital enhancing uses of technology, I wanted to say a little bit about this, but fast. The Matthew effects um, are very, very well established and very well shown. The better access to technology means that people use it then more frequently, and that means that they develop better digital literacies. And this is a reinforcing cycle that results in more capital enhancing uses. And what distinguishes the halves of technology from the rest of the world? Their income, their education, their occupation, and their lifestyle. And in these studies, funnily enough, things like having studied some foreign language and having mathematical competencies, uh, having knowledge of geography, this is of course all very, very bounded to the United States, um, but, uh, having credit cards, and ownership of things like cars, a house, and of course, technology. Gotcha. And ethnicity or race also matters a lot, but of course it's all very massively correlated with these other factors. Age matters, but in funnily enough, old age matters. Young age doesn't, because education and socioeconomic um, status trumps young age. So the myth that if we are working with young learners, they're all digital natives. It's just a myth. We have to check it out. We have to know if they are haves or have-nots, despite the young age. Some enhancing uses that have been documented. So these are good uses that make people's lives better, uses of technology. And I say not so fast, because it may depend on who we have in mind as the users. So we, in this room, I'm sure, we can all say that we use the internet and we found a job that way, we planned a trip that way, we bought a cheaper product, we found out about a political party we wanted to vote for or a club we wanted to join. We met some of our friends that way and then we met them in person. We found a potential partner, we found medical problems that we had, and we handled paperwork more efficiently. But if you look at low income, low education uses of technology, then, yes, they can use technology to find a job, but they also use it to sign up for unemployment benefits or to find out about health problems and drug grants, and to find information about how to file for bankruptcy and how to apply for food stamps online. These are all websites that the U.S. government has fully online. I'm sure they still have face-to-face -face services. But the people who need to apply for these things probably have very limited access to technology on a regular basis. And yes, uh, low income, low education users use uh, technology for social inclusion, and they stay in touch with family and friends and maintain bonds that way. If they can, they want to use technology for that too. And very interesting, a very new study showing that more than better off people, they do use technology to expand their social networks and to be able to create new ties with dissimilar others, dissimilar in race, in age, in education, which is really actually a very good thing. What about migrants, undocumented, and refugees? How do they use technology? Believe it or not, there are a few studies about it. So, they connect with children and spouses back home with technology. They use free technology to uh, um, have virtual intimacy, to be able to see and hear and listen to their uh, loved ones who they have to uh, leave behind without pain. But they also use technology to share with other immigrants imminent threats such as police roundups. Or they use technology to verify TV coverage by asking back home, has there been a bombing or not? If there's a bombing, hopefully nobody does. Those are their capital enhancing uses of technology. So the goal of technology for all should be digital fluency, which is proficiency and comfort in achieving desired outcomes using technology. But the desired outcomes 
for all should be capital enhances uses of technology defined locally and contextually. And what are the digital uh, skills that we're talking about? You all know this, so I won't say much about it. Only that some skills are really all skills that are very intensified by technology, like the ability to evaluate the reliability and credibility of different information sources. But other skills are very new, like the ability to adopt alternative identities for the purpose of improvisation and discovery, or the ability to meaningfully sample and remix media content. And so, for the 21st century, for all, we want to develop well-planned digital literacy learning that includes all three kinds of uh, new digital skills. So, okay, this is the end. Where do we go from here? What can we do to um, work at the interface between COA and SLA for equitable alternatives? I think that research into technology-mediated alternative instruction, teaching learning, should help us figure out not just how to orchestrate effective or successful call and instruction, but also equitable call and equitable instruction. And we cannot study L2 learning as double monolingualism. Instead, um, we have to study it as emergent multilingualism, because otherwise we risk distorting the object of study and creating validity and ethical problems. So, I created a checklist. I thought, okay, what can I leave the audience with? A checklist. Some things that researchers interested in contributing call and SLA research um, that supports equitable multilingualism can do. First, ask yourself, when you're designing a study, have I considered including my study underserved or marginalized multilinguals? Because we cannot serve language learners who we don't study, and what we know depends on who we study. Am I studying my participants as multilinguals, non-monolinguals, learning another kind of monolingualism, an added second monolingualism, but multilinguals who are whole learners developing multilingual repertoire? Remember, most of the world is multilingual. Ask, and if you ask and you ask right, your participants, most of them, are going to tell you that they are indeed multilingual. How will I make sure to collect and report all relevant information that will reveal any digital divide dynamics in my participants, if there are any? Education, income, and occupation must be collected and reported. Ethnicity and race must be collected and reported. Digital fluency of your participants must be collected and reported, and the technology use profiles as well. Because we must understand the multiculturalism, the sociocultural and socioeconomic views, and the digital skills of learners before we can plan good call practices or studies. Have I carefully considered in my study bridges between out of school digital worlds and classroom technological worlds? Because there is a lot of evidence growing that the two are interconnected and that people learn incidentally in uh, out of school environments, digital environments. They learn a lot of language incidentally, so then we need to plan for that. And we need to yoke digital literacy objectives and language learning objectives. Because we really want for the low technology users to help them improve their digital, digital skills in the classroom so that perhaps we can even open digital wilds for them. And for high technology users, we need to know that the technologies that we domesticate for the classroom are feeling okay for them, that they feel authentic with the proposals for technology that we offer to them. And last but not least, have I included outcomes beyond just form? And are my research methods appropriate to study those outcomes? So, a reminder, we have proposals that forms, context, meanings, and ideologies is really what we need to look at in digital media, and that the research methods need to look at multilingual texts, multilingual practices, and multilingual identities and ideologies. Not that every study can do all of this, but we must ask ourselves for every study that we design whether there is a missed opportunity to do some of this, and whether we're just going for the forms and for the one type of research methods only. And Chan, Dorothy Chan, who of course is in the room, 
proposed uh, very recently an ecological call for the post-2010s. And I really like the proposal, but I want to push ourselves a little bit more. Can we go perhaps a bit further into explicit social justice goals for the study of multilingual digital literacies and language learning? Can we ask ourselves what technologies, teaching paradigms, use of language, and principal users of computers can nurture for our marginalized multilingual, perhaps something like resilience towards conflicted bilingualism experiences and uh, ideologies, negative ideologies? And perhaps for our elite multilinguals who do experience oppression by putting themselves on the line momentarily, um, letting others consider them the other, the foreigner, the incompetent, they also can reproduce, reproduce social injustice. And they can be an asset because of their own privilege in addressing social justice. So for them, perhaps, can we have goals for technology and language learning that support and foster tolerance of dissimilar others? and learning how to use a privilege with. And all of this, I think, without losing sight of the overarching we will focus on learning to embrace and exploit the openness of language, language learning, and doing multiple learning. Okay, so this is the very, very end. I think there's a future there to be had if we can envision new interfaces that pull together the social turn, the multilingual turn, and hopefully very soon the social justice turn in SLA, and we can really create interfaces that go beyond what we've done until now. And so, I hope some of you are interested in contributing to this new goal of equitable multilingualism, and to work for a new kind of interface between the fields. Thank you. All. If we don't have time for everybody's questions, you can come and talk to Ruth uh, directly and have a longer conversation with her. But I think you have enough time. Uh, you <coughs> many ideas, so I'm very grateful for that. But I'm curious about the multilingualism versus compartmentalized multiple modeling. My question is that students in American universities or people who grew up speaking for practical reasons two or three languages in their daily life. Both tend to think of them as separate entities. And they only call themselves multilingual if they're counted, uh, but they don't see the things that you were explaining about how they cross over. Yes, I, I would agree, but I would say that that's a product of socialization into certain language ideologies. And we get so many messages about language and about multilingualism, starting in the family, and then in school very early on, and then in foreign language classrooms. So there are many beliefs that our students hold, and phenomenologically they may feel that they are three monolinguals in one, and that they try to switch from one language to the other, to the other switch off one, turn on the other. Um, but the psycholinguistic and cognitive neuroscience research shows that all the languages of the multilingual are simultaneously activated regardless of listening, speaking, reading, writing, and regardless of any intention to only let one language out to gate the other languages. So psycholinguistically we know that that's not real. So we have to work with our students. If we think they're missing on opportunities to have a much more harmonious experience with their multilingualism and empowering experience and missing on pedagogical opportunities to leverage their multilingualism to learn languages better. If we think we're missing on those things, then we can work with them and their negative advantages. But we have to be convinced ourselves first. Yes. Of languages in sort of everyday 
course, that's happening. But in the classroom context, right. do we engineer those kinds of conditions? Well, um, I think we can if we think our context is appropriate and, and good for that. And we can abstain from it if we think our contexts are not. But we have to be very sure that we're not just slaves to our negative ideologies, but that we are doing it purposefully because we think it's best for our students. Um, let me just clarify the translanguage in pedagogy as a pedagogical tool is very popular with English as a second language and with immigrant education. And the main argument is that it really creates a very different standing for these students who have been forever convinced that their language and their communication is defective. And so this new pedagogy for them, it really saves their psychological, mental health, and their self-appreciation um, <coughs> of who they are and what strengths they have. So for those contexts, I think there is research showing that it's very effective. Now, foreign language uh, educators are very, very hesitant to use anything like that because we do have another concern, which is maximizing the um, um, instruction in the target language because there isn't much access outside of the classroom for contact with the target language. That is a legitimate concern. However, is sometimes a little bit more of a mirage than a reality. And uh, sometimes I see foreign language educators who are terrified of letting anything like other than the target language in if it happens in their classrooms. We can't be slaves to pedagogies, uh, ideologies like that. So we have to try out things and see whether it's going to work or not with our students. I would not uh, advocate any pedagogy regardless of context. Um, If we don't have any more questions, you are free to talk to the girls afterwards. I think uh, the food is going to be uh, somewhere around here. Just follow the smell from the back. Yes. And uh, feel free to see that.